Good evening, welcome, and thank you for joining us here. Uh, my name is Richard Fontaine. I'm the president of the Center for New American Security. And it's a real pleasure to welcome you all here to celebrate the publication of Robert Kaplan's new book, The Revenge of Geography, What the Map Tells Us About Coming Conflicts and the Battle Against Fate. I've heard it said before that you honor a great author not by reading his books, but by buying them. <laughs> if you subscribe to this view, you'll be happy to know that books will be sold after the con conversation on the stage um, in this room uh, back here. Bob Kaplan's work is no doubt well known to many in this audience. He's been a senior fellow at CNAS since March of 2008, a foreign correspondent for The Atlantic for about a quarter of a century, uh, and is currently chief geopolitical analyst at Stratfor. I first became acquainted with Bob's writings through his book, The Arabis, which traces the history of the tight-knit group of Westerners living and working in the, in the Middle East. And since that book, the very titles of his work, Balkan Ghosts, The Coming Anarchy, Imperial Grunts, have provoked intense debate in foreign policy circles. Bob's most recent book, Monsoon, The Indian Ocean and the Future of American Power, has become required reading among the many who are interested in the future of strategic competition in the coming decades. As I've gotten to know Bob over these past few years, I've learned that he's not only a superb journalist, scholar, and strategic thinker, but also a warm and wonderful human being. He also demonstrates a truly remarkable intellectual curiosity. I believe that we're the only two at CNS who decided together to read Ulysses in our spare time. That's true. Now Bob graces us with his new book, The Revenge of Geography. In it, he argues, and I quote, counterintuitive though it may seem, the way to grasp what's happening in this world of instantaneous news is to rediscover something basic, the spatial representation of humanity's divisions, possibilities, and most important, constraints the map leads us to the right sorts of questions. That's a provocative argument and one that we will examine in some detail in tonight's conversation. Joining Bob in that conversation is David Ignatius, one of the nation's foremost strategic thinkers in his own right. A columnist for the Washington Post, David is a renowned writer of both fiction and nonfiction, and his latest novel, Blood Money, published last year, is the most recent in a string of best-selling works of spy fiction. David is well known for his vast command of international affairs and his keen insights into the workings of government and other actors. With these two gentlemen, we're poised for an illuminating and intriguing conversation about the world, the future, and the revenge of geography. Bob and David, over to you. Well, thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, I think you're probably not supposed to say this as the serious uh, moderator guy, but I love this book. Um, it's embarrassing how uh, marked up it is, how many yellow post-its I put in it. Um, I'm not doing that just to flatter the teacher, but uh, because I really liked it. Um, and I want to try um, to walk the audience um, uh, through this, or have Bob walk the audience through it. And I'd like to start um, with a provocative opening uh, comment that, sh that you make, uh, yeah. Bob. You say, my reporting over three decades has convinced me that we all need to recover a sensibility about time and space that has been lost in the jet and information ages when elite molders of public opinion dash across oceans and continents in hours, something which allows them to talk glibly about what the distinguished New York Times columnist Tom Friedman as labeled a flat world. Instead, I will re introduce readers to a group of decidedly unfashionable thinkers who will push up hard against the no notion that geography no longer matters. So I want to just ask you to start with the basics of geography and tell us why mountains, rivers, plains, promontories hmm. matter so decisively in the world that you sketch in the book. Well, David, um, what so many, um, with so many opinion writers in the opinion pages, the distinguished literary journals are concerned with, and this is epitomized by, you know, by Tom Friedman's work, who I respect greatly, is that what we can do, it's all the things we can accomplish if only we had the right solution and everything. And what I'm doing is, I'm saying that's fine, that's human agency, that's fighting against fate. But what I'm showing you in this book is the other side. I'm not disagreeing with what they say, but I'm saying there's another reality, the formidable barriers to human agency, which if you do not respect, you can never overcome. 
And chief among those formidable bar barriers is geography, which is so basic that it goes unremarked upon. Um, if you want to know about a country, rather than see who its leaders are or what their policies are, look at the map. Look at the map of the United States in terms of seas, promontories, harbors. The east coast of the United States, the 13 colonies, was just jam-packed with great natural harbors. Now, the whole coast of Africa, thousands of miles, has relatively few good natural harbors, which has hindered Africa's development. But the east coast was packed with them. And the United States, the continental core of the US, was the last resource-rich part of the temperate zone that was settled at the time of the European Enlightenment with more miles of inland waterways flowing in a convenient east-west fashion than the rest of the world's waterways combined. So I'm saying that Americans, we, we're important not only because of our ideas and our democracy, but because of where we happen to live as well. So, and, so, and so that's why these things like mountains matter. The Himalayas matter. They've allowed India and China to develop into two completely distinct great world civilizations without having much to do with each other through long periods of history. So let's just take that image uh, that, that you offered of of America, this uh, amazingly uh, uh, suitable uh, geographical place with all these great natural harbors and rivers that run the right ways. But that was true for thousands of years uh, and did not lead to the development in what we think of as, as the United States uh, to great civilization, outreaching. Um, it wasn't until uh, European civilization arrived and began to make powerful use of those great harbors and rivers that, that, the, that, that the geographical advantages were obvious. So help us to, to think about why it's geography that we should focus yeah. on as opposed to the cultural or civilizational aspects right. of Europe coming. Right. Well, that was due to the development of sailing ships and the right sails, which enabled cross-Atlantic voyages. So the development of technology, while it shortened distance, it did not negate geography. It merely made it more precious and more important because it opened up a whole new geography uh, to, the, um, to the world conflict system and the world trade system. Culture and economics and peoples flow from, flow from the geography because what is culture? It's the ex accumulated experience of a specific people on a specific landscape over hundreds of thousands of years that leads to traditions and, harbor and habits that can be identifiable. Um, you know, one of the places that I've always considered to have the most deeply dense, identifiable cultures is Romania. Um, uh, you know, nobody can mistake that there is a specific Romanian culture that's been formed by the conflict between invaders coming from Central Europe and those coming from the Anatolian Plateau. Uh, which, you know, which has fostered a very, sus you know, suspicious um, negotiating style character that you can see right up into the politics in Bucharest to this day. And I, I can go through every country, or not every country, but many countries and talk about that. Talk um, a, a moment about, about Germany. One of the arresting images uh, in, the, in the book is your description, you're quoting a German historian named Golo Mann, uh, who called Germany a big prison, meaning that it was caught between the North Sea, the Baltic, and the Alps, and it could only, if it wanted to, to expand, it could only move east or west. It was in this tight prison. Um, that sounds like the kind of um, analysis that was, that was popular a century ago when people talked about Lebensraum, uh, yeah. but has gone out of fashion. And, and explain to us, when we think about Germany today, when we think about Europe today, yeah. what your analysis would tell us. All right, Golo Mann, of course, was the son of the great novelist Thomas Mann, and he wrote a great history of Germany. 
And his point was that Germany has natural boundaries to the north and the north and Baltic seas, to the south with the Alps and further afield to the Carpathians. But in the east of the west is flat plains. So Germany had wars over the centuries with France or that area and with Poland and with that area. And because Germany was a continental power, a sandwich between maritime Europe on one hand and the heartland of Europe towards Russia on the other. It was always problematic which way it would go, how it would develop. Now, I came across this book by accident in early 1989, early 1989. The Berlin Wall would fall that November. And I had been back and forth to East Germany. And it occurred to me, after reading this book and other books, that the Berlin Wall or the dividing line between Eastern and Western Germany was merely one peregrination of German history. That Germany would have different, it would have different, uh, would reinvent itself in different territorial ways in the future. So today we have a united Germany that trades immensely with Poland, that has had an historic rapprochement with Poland, that has a lot of businesses in the Baltic states, that whereas the European Union and NATO were meant to keep Russia out and the Germans down, now the Germans are triumphant economically in Europe. Germany may not have the solution to every European economic problem, but it's, Berlin is the point of arbitration for all of them. Um, so the question really arises, and this gets back to geography, uh, with Russia ne still needing buffer zones in Eastern Europe. Remember, the, for, the collapse of the Wars Warsaw Pact did not end Russia's in insecurity facing West, because it had faced invasions by Swedes, Lithuanians, Poles, Germans, French throughout history. So we're back to... Um, uh, a, a Russia, a, a, as a regional power, flush with natural gas wealth, a rich and wealthy Germany, a Poland between them, but a Poland that we now know has significant stores, perhaps, of natural shale gas underneath it, which may make it an energy power into the 21st century. So this is living geography. And your, your argument about, about Russia and Russia's insecurity would be basically be it's too flat. Yeah, Russia has, I think, half the world's longitudes, but it's flat, it's indefensible, its rivers run north-south rather than east-west, so they don't unite the country, and it has less people than Bangladesh. 141 million people, Bangladesh has more people. So Vladimir Putin's cynical neo-imperialism are the wages of a deep, geographical insecurity. And that's how we should understand him. Not as a madman, not as a totalitarian, but as a very traditional Russian autocrat. So one of the really interesting hinges of this book uh, is your discussion about the fall of the Berlin Wall. And if I read you right, uh, you say that it made us too optimistic. It made us too convinced that, uh, that human agency uh, our, our system of democracy, our system of free markets uh, would have a transforming power. Um, talk about that and, and, and take that story through the 1980s and into the 90s. Right. Uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall eliminated constraints. We thought that because we could get the Red Army out of Eastern Europe, it suddenly would have a transformative effect in the Middle East, in Sub-Saharan Africa, that the world was not open, would be open for democracy. Uh, democracy would come in all those places, but it would be a long, at times, bloody and, cir and, cir and circuitous story. Um, in the 1990s, and this was the real genesis for the book, I saw how the US military, particularly the Air Force, defeated geography in the Balkans. Turns out the US Army did mountains very well despite their protestations. And, and, and the successful conclusions to the wars in Bosnia and Kosovo were a big factor in allowing NATO to expand to the Black Sea, though, no, though nobody really wrote that. Um, and it was really the success of the Balkans, the success of Panama, the success of Haiti, though we were bloodied a bit in, in, in Somalia. Um, that made people think we can do anything. 
Um, um, and that's when geography got its revenge in the mountains and deserts of Iraq and Afghanistan. Because a transformative moment for me, I was embedded with uh, the, the 1st Battalion of the 5th Marines in, in, in Kuwait in March 2004, and we were making an overland journey of several hundred miles to Fallujah. And Fallujah was not yet in the news. The Battle of Fallujah was still a month away. Uh, the first Battle of Fallujah. And all we did was transport one Marine battalion from one place to another. No fighting in between, wasn't particularly dangerous, but the logistics were absolutely immense. Gas stations, m mountains of water bottles, of tool kits, of meals ready to eat. Of, uh, uh, um, it was just an immense logistical exercise to get men and women and materiel from northern Kuwait to Fallujah without any fighting. And there you saw how distance mattered, how you, know, how, you, know, how you just couldn't defeat distance through, through the latest technology. Um, I think it might be interesting for this uh, audience if you'd personalize uh, the story of Iraq a little bit and talk about your own views. Um, this is a place you, you knew that you traveled in in the 1980s, the time of Saddam Hussein. Um, you were a supporter of the war. Explain why. And then I found some of the, the most wrenching passages of this book, discussions about what a disaster Iraq, the Iraq war has proved for every party, the United States, most of all the Iraqis. Uh, yes. Um, I knew Iraq intimately in the 1980s as a reporter. I covered the Iran-Iraq war from the Iraq side. Um, Iraq was like a vast prison yard lit up by high wattage lamps under Saddam Hussein. It was so suffocating that I could compare it to no place in the Arab world, but I could compare it to Ceausescu's Romania, which I also knew intimately. And to go from Saddam Hussein's Iraq to Hafez al-Assad's Syria was like coming up for liberal humanist air. Uh, you know, because we tend to say all dictators are bad, all Democrats are, are good. You know, we eliminate, we erase distinctions. And it's distinctions that give us the complexity we need, we need to understand the world. And yes, Hafez al-Assad ran a brutal dictatorship, but it was nothing like Saddam. Um, and, I, and I had my passport taken away for 10 days by the Iraqi authorities uh, when I was in Iraqi Kurdistan at the time. I was very nervous, obviously. I only got it back at the airport before I left. And um, I was a journalist who got too close to my story. And I was intent on eliminating Saddam Hussein. Um, I believed, like a lot of people, in d different Western countries in the world and on both sides of the aisle in the US that there were WMD. But more importantly, I believed a regime this suffocatingly brutal, you couldn't trust it. You know, you had to assume that, that, that it existed um, there. And the war turned out so miserably, of course, I'm not a fatalist. Had we had different generals, different strategy, could have been different. You just can't simply say it wouldn't have mattered no matter what we did. But on the other hand, a lot of the mistakes we made were implicit in the hubris of the conception. Um, and you know, and that, because we can play counterfactuals all we want, um, but at the end of the day, you're stuck with the facts that you have, and you have to live with them and deal with them. So you, you add up the cost, uh, almost 5,000 American dead, uh, perhaps hundreds of thousands of Iraqis killed, a trillion dollars in cost. Uh, and you say that even if Iraq, even if everything turned out great and Iraq somehow became uh, an American ally and quasi-democratic, it'd still be hard to justify it. And there's this line which really struck me. Iraq undermined a key element in the mindset of some that the projection of American power always had a moral result. So that's really an argument that Iraq was fundamentally 
um, an immoral war, not simply a failure, but one that was immoral? Um, even moral, even democracies that have the best of intentions can take actions that have um, amoral or immoral results depending upon how they carry it out and how well they think things through, not just one step in advance, but five chess moves uh, um, um, ahead of the time. Um, so, you know, this is why, um, this gets me to a discussion later on in the book about realism. Um, and what I say is, what is realism? Uh, realism is more of a sensibility than a, than a philosophy. It's about you, you recognize interests over values. Because if you recognize interests, you will be very careful about where you get involved overseas. And if you recognize interests, you'll respect the interests of other nations, and therein lies compromise. Whereas if you make wars out of values purely, you're liable to demonize your opponent as immoral simply because he disagrees with you on values, and therein lies war and conflict. And it's precisely because realists expect conflict that they're less likely to overreact to it um, than, uh, than, um, than, than moralists. Also, realists also value order above freedom. Because without some semblance of order, freedom doesn't mean anything. People can't practice it in the first place. And that was another thing I learned about Iraq, which was um, that even the tyranny of Saddam Hussein, as horrible as it was, precisely because it was a tyranny, there were rules. And people could get around. And people, their daily life was predictable. You knew what was not allowed. But in a state of anarchy, which is what Iraq descended to in 2006 and 2007, there were no rules. You um, also talk in the book about the two uh, governing analogies, if you will. The, the Munich analogy that uh, compromise is fatal. Look at Munich. Look at how Munich led to the Second World War, the rise of Hitler, the, the Holocaust. And the, and the Vietnam analogy, which argues the limits of power, the, yeah. the, the realist argument you're making that these efforts at big transformative rolls of the dice often have very uh, unfortunate uh, results. And you, you really talk about foreign policy as being uh, the, these two um, ideas or analogies uh, in play. And I, I'd be interested in your own, I mean, I, I end up thinking that you're a Vietnam analogy guy, um, that, the, that the sort of Munich, you know, we must stand uh, tough, um, that, that, should, that you wouldn't subscribe to that. Is that, am I reading you um, in the book right? Uh, as, as I, first of all, let me say that realism leads to the map, which is the spatial representation of humanity's divisions and interests in the first place. And that's how I segue into the discussion of geography, which dominates the rest of the book. As far as Munich and, and Vietnam, I think you have to take them both together. You cannot be a Munich guy or a, Viet, or a Vietnam guy. Munich is, is an analogy that tends to thrive when the country has been in peace and prosperity for long enough so it feels it can do anything. It feels it can intervene on, 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 uh, on behalf of subject and oppressed peoples around the world. And it doesn't think about the cost because it hasn't had to pay the cost in war for several decades by now. Vietnam is about taking care of one's own and about paying attention to how things can go so horribly wrong despite the best of intentions. Now, if you're a total Vietnam person, you'll be such an utter realist that it will be too crude. You won't have anything beyond interests. And a nation requires ideals merely for its self-identity. Uh, to define itself. Um, if you're only a Munich person, you'll be intervening every time there's a massive human rights atrocity. You'll, be, you'll have troops in, in five different places at once. So it's only when the two analogies are put together that, uh, that, 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 that a stable uh, policy can emerge, a policy that can get, get public support over the long term. So let's talk, as I'm sure the audience is, is going to want to in, in your questions, about uh, current affairs. We're in the middle of a week in which we're seeing uh, 
just how unstable this great big part of the world, uh, the Near East, the Middle East, can be. We, net, we had today violence extending as far as, as Bangladesh. And I wonder, um, mm -hmm. through the lens that you've developed in this, in this book, the analytical approach, what you would say um, to policymakers as they try to figure out how to respond to an Islamic world that's just exploding with anger and instability? Um, I would say that um, communications technology has collapsed distance, but rather than negate geography, it's only increased its preciousness. Because now you have people in, in Indonesia who care vitally about what the Israelis did interrupting the flotilla bound for Gaza. Um, and you have crowds in Bangladesh, and I'm sure tomorrow we may see in Malaysia and in, in, in Indonesia and elsewhere, um, enraged, about, um, enraged about a movie that was made in California. But while, uh, but while rage can spread around the world, um, once the, the rage is a starting point, once you start to analyze what's likely to happen in Libya next, what's liable to happen in Egypt next, you get very different scenarios, and what's liable to happen in Syria next, you get very different scenarios based on the legacy of geography. Geography shows us that Libya was not a, never a country, but a vague geographical expression, with Tripoli oriented towards Greater Carthage and Tunisia, Benghazi oriented towards Alexandria and Egypt. So because it was never a country, it can only be governed through the most austere totalitarian means. And once that collapsed, though we have an elected government in Tripoli, it cannot project power beyond greater Tripoli. So you have a problem of governmental incapacity um, in, 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 in Libya that cannot deal with the crisis. In Egypt, it's different. Egypt, you have a country that has been an age-old cluster of civilization for thousands of years, a cohesive community along the Nile, uh, where the government has far greater bureaucratic and institutional power, even under this new, very tenuous regime, than the government in Libya has. The government in Egypt has an army. It, you know, it has police forces, but its problem is political. Can an Islamic government take actions against Islamic demonstrators? And to take the other big issue that we're thinking about uh, this week, um, Iran. Iran is a big theme in your book. You talk in one chapter about the Iranian pivot. Um, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel um, has, sees Iran very much in terms of the Munich analogy. He sees it in Iran heading toward having a nuclear weapons capability that uh, could threaten the existence uh, of, uh, of Israel and so draws policy con conclusions from that. You have a, a broader uh, historical and, and, and geographical analysis and I, I'm, I'm curious um, what you'd say about the decisions that we're going to be looking at over the next you know, few weeks, months, uh, you know, 12 to 18 months is going to be resolved one way or the other. What, what would your advice be to, to people uh, making policy? First of all, Iran is a much more serious state than Saudi Arabia or any in the Middle or any in the Arab world. There have been civil, there have been governments, uh, Persian-speaking governments on the Iranian plateau going back to antiquity. Uh, Iran is synonymous with the Iranian plateau, which it fronts on both the Caspian and the Persian Gulf, the two oil-rich portions of the greater Middle East. It has roads and pipelines open to Central Asia on one hand and down into Iraq on the other. This Iranian regime may have trouble. It may transform itself. It may even be overthrown in coming years. But there will always be an Iran. There will always be a great Iranian power on the Iranian plateau. Saudi Arabia is more tenuous. It's the creation of a family. Um, it's not synonymous with the Arabian Peninsula. Um, there are many other countries on the peninsula. Its borders are, 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 are artificial. The Nejd in the center has always had trouble keeping Hejaz in line, Hejaz being more cosmopolitan, where the holy cities are. 
Um, so it, you know, Iran is a, Iran is very strongly institutionalized. It, it's not a one-man simplistic thugocracy like Saddam Hussein. It's got different centers of power which compete against each other in a very complex bureaucratic order. Uh, again, the gift of the Iranian plateau and the geographic legitimacy it provides the government over millennia. Um, I would say that. Um, our, our grand strategy has to be that at, the U.S. has been estranged from Iran for a third of a century. That's a decade longer than we've been, we were estranged with Red China between 48 and 72. Um, at some point, and this is what the Saudis really worry and think about, there has to be a U.S. rapprochement with Iran. Um, and we have to think in those terms. Does going to war aid that? Does, um, uh, all of Iran supports a nuclear program, but it's unclear that all of Iran supports nuclear weapons. Um, you know, th you know, there's a distinction there. Uh, so the real critical factor is what do we need to do to normalize relations with Iran? Now the answer to that may be a very strong military reaction if they weaponize. You know, I'm not being a, a, you know, an appeaser here. But the long range strategy, what the, end, the road map has to be to normalizing U.S. relations with Iran. That's, that's an interesting, uh, good, uh, good answer. Um, to, um, uh, I mean, it may well be that uh, confrontation is, is the way to the eventual normalization that neither side seems able to achieve now. Because um, uh, my time as your questioner is about to end and the audience is about to begin, I want to just ask a couple questions about the conclusions uh, okay. of this book, yeah. which are really um, fascinating and, and counterintuitive. Um, one conclusion, as I read it, was that the U.S. should think about how to uh, withdraw sensibly, uh, uh, gracefully, if you will, from its, its role uh, after the Second World War as the overwhelming dominant power. Um, that that, that, that um, process uh, of resizing American power, if you will, uh, is, is essential. Am I reading you right? And maybe yes, you could you explain are. that, explain yes, that in more detail. Uh, the U.S. has to think about how do we, over the decades and centuries, make a graceful exit from history uh, as the dominant great power. Um, Rome was overcome by northern, what they called barbarian tribes, and that may have been inevitable in the long term, but it was certainly not inevitable in the way that it happened. It was because Rome stopped evolving. Um, is what happened. Rome became, Rome became too brittle. Um, it makes sense that we need, to, uh, we need to gradually, organically offload responsibilities to like-minded others and allies around the world, rather than us covering uh, uh, so totally the military burden. And let me talk about Asia in this regard. Um, uh, China is developing a significant sea power. Um, uh, this is normal because China's land borders are more secure than they've been since the early 19th century. So because China is secure on land, it, it, has, it can afford to go to sea in the manner that it hasn't had uh, you know, uh, um, previously. Does the U.S. continue to dominate the Western Pacific, the U.S. Navy and Air Force, to the same degree that it did throughout the Cold War and the post-Cold War? Or does the U.S. try to encourage countries like Japan, Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, Australia particularly, and others to bear some more of the burden? Um, that's what I mean by, an, by a graceful exit mm -hmm. from history. So I'm going to let the audience um, discover through your questions what the other main conclusion of the book is. But I want to just ask you bef before we um, turn it over, so how would you respond if uh, in the back row of the audience Mitt Romney stood up and said, that's, you know, uh, Mr. Kaplan, you're being defeatist. Uh, you're, you're walking away from America's historical essential role. Well, America is the essential power, and you're talking about an inevitable, necessary decline. And I don't. How would you respond to that? I would say I'm not being defeatist. I'm being sly and wild, <laughs> um, because I want American influence to extend long into the decades. But it cannot do that 
bearing the same exact level of burden that we've been bearing now. Um, you know, in the Middle East, um, uh, we cannot confront Russia, confront China, uh, be the hegemon of sorts in the greater Middle East um, endlessly. It, you know, we have to, I believe, move closer to uh, Vladimir Putin to balance against China, but at the same time not let countries like Vietnam and the Philippines drag us into a war with China over the South China Sea. It's about clever balancing. And in any case, the U.S. has so much shale oil deposits in Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and other places that I could name, which also is about geography, that we are going to be, a, because of energy reserves, we are going to be a significant power for decades to come in any case. So now is the time to try to get allies and like-minded others to do more. I would just note that this book has on the cover a blurb from Henry Kissinger. So um, this is obviously a set of arguments uh, that people need to consider very seriously. So let's go to the audience for questions. Um, keep your questions brief and uh, identify yourselves, please. Yes, please, sir. I see the hand up right there. Yes. Yes, hello. Uh my name is Paul Stern. I'm from the Institute of World Politics, and uh, just wanted to ask you about uh, Russia, because the argument that you presented about Russia's real or alleged insecurity, that's been essentially used, the argument's been employed to justify pretty much any and all expansion from Moscow during the Tsarist period, during the Soviet period, etc. Uh, so what... Now, it, what about the interests of the countries that uh, around Russia that are impacted by this alleged Russian need for security? Yes, uh, this Russian need for insecurity goes back centuries. But Vladimir Putin is not trying to recreate the Warsaw Pact. Uh, he's not going to invade the Baltic states. Um, he, you know, the limited invasion of, invasion of Georgia is about all he can muster. M Russia lacks the military bandwidth to take back Central Asia. He can forgive Kyrgyz loans, for instance. He can maneuver around there. Um, but Swedish banks are very, uh, very busy in the Baltic states. Uh, um, the, uh, the Polish military is developing. Um, yes, the Russians are trying to acquire electricity, grids, and other infrastructure and banks in Central and Eastern Europe now that the EU, e the European Union, lacks the cap financial capacity to help develop places like Serbia and Ukraine the way they did in the early part of the last decade in the 1990s. So Russia is not coming back as the former Soviet, U as the new Soviet Union. It, it is a, it is a, a substantial re regional power that can be contained through normal means, through negotiation and, 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 and arming our allies. Yeah, um, and part particularly, why do the Poles and the Romanians go along with us on missions in Iraq and Afghanistan and special forces and Marines deployments in sub-Saharan Africa? Not because they support everything we do. It's because they, the Poles and the Romanians and others know that it's not NATO per se that's going to defend them. It's the United States. Uh, yes, in the first row, please. I think they would like a microphone because this is being uh, recorded and broadcast. Yes, sir. Dan Sui, uh, Department of Geography from the, Ohio, uh, from the Ohio State University. First of all, as a professional geographer, I want to thank you for uh, over the past uh, decades for writing so many books of putting geography and maps into the public consciousness in the U.S. And my first question to you is, you know that recently there have been some territorial disputes among China, Japan, and South Korea. So what's, uh, can you, uh, what's your feeling, what's going to happen uh, next? And secondly, what kind of a strategy the U.S. should take in terms of dealing uh, with uh, China, the rising power of China, in order to uh, secure, uh, ensure the new security, uh, American security. Yeah, I think what's been happening from Japan south to Indonesia, the East Sea, the South China Sea, the Sea of Japan, 
is that in the 50s and 60s and 70s, all these countries were internally focused. They were developing their own economies, their own national capacities, their, you know, their own militaries. Um, this is particularly, you know, Vietnam and Malaysia had internal wars of rebellion and, and nation building. Um, the Philippines had the Huck Rebellion in the 1950s. Japan was just coming online as a significant power in, in the 1970s. And it was Korea under Park Chung-hee that really developed into a significant power. What's happened now is all these countries have developed already. And because they have developed, they now have the ability to project power outwards into the blue territorial soils that they claim, meaning the seas. They didn't have this capacity before. So now we're seeing conflicts about islands and geographical features that are below water and high tide that we never saw before. You know, people say, has everyone gone crazy in East Asia? No. Everyone's developed in East Asia, and now they have militaries, and there's this conflicting, and they've developed navies and air forces, and there's this conflicting, um, uh, there's this conflict over geographical space. It's a battle over geogra geographical space, not about ideas. There's no ideas involved here. Uh, this is all about territory. This is all about status, about you know, national status. You know, people say, people thought in Europe that nationalism was out of fashion, we're in a post-national age. That's not what I see in East Asia. Um, in East Asia, I see nationalism as very feisty and healthy. That's one of, one of the interesting things in this book is that our ideas about globalization and the end of national boundaries are misplaced. Yes, sir, second row. Thank you very much. Munzer Sleiman with Al Mayadeen TV based in Beirut, Lebanon. Can you give us interpretation why there was a double veto by Russia and China with regards to Syrian situation? And that veto was three times over. And do you think there is any impact of the this week events in Libya, Egypt, Yemen, and others? on the approach of this administration toward Syrian crisis? Um, let me say that, um, the, you know, China's a bit far afield, but Russia has interests in Syria. Uh, you know, the way the Russians see it is they've already suffered a setback with the overthrow of Gaddafi, uh, with the demise of Saddam Hussein, who was, uh, you know, despite all the ink spilled about how we supported him in the Iran-Iraq war, was still mainly closer to Moscow at the time uh, than he was, m much closer than to the United States. Syria, uh, the, Russia cannot be happy about the possible loss of another ally in the Middle East. Russia has a certain degree of interest in a naval base in Tartus. Uh, you know, it's perch in the Eastern Mediterranean. More importantly, Russia knows, Putin knows, that Central Asia is presently a powder keg that gets much less news than it deserves. And if you thought the Arab Spring was tumultuous and occasionally violent, uh, you're going to love Central Asia. Um, um, because Central Asia does not, did not have the European liberalizing effects on, on intellectuals like the Arab world, which is proximate to Europe, had. It, it had its intelligentsia completely pulverized by Stalin, and I can go on and on. So Central Asia could really be a tinderbox. And the last thing Russia wants to see is an Islamic state in Syria. That, 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 becomes, you know, that becomes a model or a symbol for anything that might, er that might erupt in Central Asia. So, so Russia's interests in, in trying to keep Assad in power, if that is at all possible, are they're, they're understandable interests. They're legitimate interests that stem from Russia's geographical situation. I, I would just. Yes, you know, we have so many hands with, with apologies that we probably should, should uh, let other, other folks uh, ask questions. Yes, please. Thank you. Sir, thank you for being here. Uh, 
Uh, my name is Jacob Breach, uh, Department of Defense. Um, my question here is, um, the strategic rebalancing to Asia, in your view, um, is this an attempt to contain China? And given the geographic uh, problems that China has being surrounded by numerous uh, ethnic states, and uh, not to mention India and uh, increasingly hostile Southeast Asian powers, will the strategic, re strategic rebalancing be effective? Um, I think, um, you know, I was in Beijing recently, and in Beijing there are thousands of American businessmen, thousands of American students, thousands of Chinese students here. You can't use the word containment because it has a Cold War vintage that doesn't capture the complexity of relationship between the United States and China. Um, speaking about the pivot, um, I think the pivot was a natural occurrence that would have happened no matter what it was called or termed because we, we're concluding two ground wars in one part of the world. In previous decades and centuries, when the U.S. has concluded ground engagements, it's often retreated into semi-isolationism. This was also true after World War II. Remember, it was the Korean War that got us, that gave Harry Truman the, uh, the political space he needed to send troops back to Europe. Um, so we didn't want to tr uh, retreat into semi-isolationism. There was meant to be a, a redirection of policy to Asia actually after the Berlin Wall fell, but then Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. We got involved in a war in Iraq, and more importantly, the Army and Navy um, got, got, got very involved in no-fly zones in Iraq uh, right up through the next 12 years. Then there was the Iraq War in Afghanistan, so the pivot is really saying we're back where we were in 1989. Uh, we've had two decades of, uh, you, you know, of distraction. So now we're going to show Asia that we're there, that we're back, that we're engaged. The problem with the pivot is that um, it, it, it implies that you could turn your attention away from the Middle East. And, the pro and what the Middle East shows is you can never turn your attention away from the Middle East. So that's the real challenge with the pivot. I want to turn to this side of the room, uh, the gentleman uh, with the blue shirt, and then uh, you, sir. Yes. Uh, well, we'll go in reverse. Yes. Bob McBrien, former government. Uh, talking about geographic divides, uh, you mentioned, I believe in your book, you make reference to the U.S. and Mexico, and how do you view the effect of things such as transnational criminal organizations and the confluence of such things as radical extremists, the movement of Iran into Venezuela in some respects, and the fact that we have this very large border that is essentially flat. Yeah. Yeah, well, I end my book talking about Mexico because I believe not only is China and the greater Middle East crucial to the U.S. destiny, but Mexico is on the same level. And it's on the same level of importance because Latin history is moving north uh, demographically. Um, the average Guatemalan and Honduran is 20. The average Mexican is a bit older in his mid or late 20s. The average American is 37. There are much younger populations that are growing at faster rates than ours. And whatever we do with immigration, there's going to be more Latin-speaking people in our society. Um, you know, Arnold Toynbee wrote uh, back in the early part of the 20th century that when you have an artificial border, which our, much of our southern border is between a highly developed society and an economically uh, less, an institutionally less developed society, the border doesn't stay stable, but it moves in the direction of the less developed society, which ultimately finds a way through immigration and whatnot to overcome the more developed society. Now, Mexico has seen 50,000 deaths in, in, in violence since 2006. That's two and a half times the deaths in Syria, though over six years. And what's interesting is most of those deaths were in the northern third of the country abutting the U.S. border. Now, recently, violence has dropped in, nor in northern Mexico, but that's because the cartels are really consolidating their controls and are setting up real honest-to-goodness geographical spaces 
um, you know, uh, um, um, close to the U.S. border. So the way Mexico develops as a society, I believe, will impact us more over the long run than what happens in Iraq or Afghanistan. And, and I push you again on the policy implications of that. I mean, that is the other major conclusion that geography tells us that it's that southern border with Mexico that's going to be crucial. But, but in light of what you said, this is an inevitable zone of conflict, uh, pressures moving the border in effect uh, northwards. What's, the, what's wise policy for the United States? Um, first of all, we have to be very careful about intervening because of sensitivities that go back to history. Remember, we fought a war with Mexico. We've had incursions into Mexico under General Pershing. Everything we do in Mexico has to go through a very tight diplomatic filter. Um, that being said, there's more we can do um, in terms of helping the Mexican authorities uh, than we have been doing. Um, you know, the ultimate power of the United States is the time that our top decision makers can devote to a problem in a given day. Um, and that's why we can't have three wars or two wars going on at once. You know, if we set up a no-fly zone in Syria, what if it, the Persian Gulf erupts? What if the South China Sea erupts? Uh, we'd have trouble handling that. Um, that's why um, if we could have more of our top decision makers spend time on the Mexico problem, we would probably come out with, come up with more bolder, innovative ways to help the Mexicans, who, by the way, you know, there's another side to the Mexican story. Mexico is one of the world's leading economies. Its economy has been growing the last few years, rather impressively. It's not a, a country you can easily categorize or make into a cliche. It's both incredibly dynamic, but incredibly dysfunctional and lawless at the same time. Uh, the gentleman right behind our last questioner. Hi, Pablo Saloria for the U.S. African Development Foundation. Another region that's experienced a lot of instability and conflict over the past 10 years, at least, is West Africa. When you look at it, there's terrorism, uh, drug trafficking right now, civil wars, constant coup d'etats, poverty, and we can go on and on and on. Um, when you look at the map of West Africa, what do you see? Um, what I see in sub-Saharan Africa in general is that after no growth and just all bad news in the 1990s, since about the middle of the last decade, African economic growth has been about 6 7%, which is the most impressive in the world. Now, you have to subtract from that the 2% of population growth, which makes it different than the rise of the Asian tigers. Also, there's no real manufacturing developing in West Africa or elsewhere in sub-Saharan in Africa. South Africa is an exception. And it's manufacturing and developing of institutions that really show countries are out of the woods. They're really on, in the safe way. What we have in West Africa is that the wars, the rebellions seem to have burnt out. Um, but nothing much is happening in the way of stabilizing institutions or developing uh, real strong economic bases. That may come later. It's too soon. Remember, the Ivory Coast was in war only up until about 15 months ago, if memory serves. So it, it takes a while. Um, it might be that you know China and places like Bangladesh are becoming too expensive for low cost textile manufacturers and and and, and you know and and so you, the question is who's the next China or the next Bangladesh well it won't be one place but it's possible that countries in sub-Saharan Africa could become the new destination for uh, textile production, which would stabilize the economies, provide jobs for young people. Um, so the, while I wrote a very pessimistic article in the Atlantic Monthly on Africa in 1994, those, the things that I worried about played out in the late 90s and in the early part of the last decade in terms of wars throughout the region. But now I see sub-Saharan Africa on a much more positive trend. Interesting that the Chinese seem to agree with you from their level of investment. Yeah. Um, yes, ma'am. In the second row here on the side, yes. Uh, Caitlin Antrim, Rule of Law Committee for the Oceans. Uh, 
In the, in the mid-century, uh, Nicholas Bickman said that geography was one of the most important factors in foreign affairs because it was the most permanent. Mm -hmm. This year, we just saw the Arctic ice cap drop down another 750,000 square kilometers and appears to be opening more this session. What do you think this trend will mean, not next year or even next decade, but say in a generation? as okay. that becomes more open, both for Russia and for Canada in particular. Yes, uh, Nicholas Spikeman is someone I devote a whole chapter to in this book um, because he's very, uh, very, very provocative. And here was a man, by the way, who in the middle of World War II, when it was unclear that China would defeat Japan, predicted that, uh, predicted that, um, uh, that China, who was our ally at the time, would ultimately become our adversary for geographical reasons. And he also said, you know, when Europe was fighting for its life against Germany, he said a united Europe uh, could really be a, a competitor for the United States. So he was very clairvoyant. In terms of the Arctic ice cap, um, uh, this is playing out over decades. If you had an, o an Arctic open for shipping, and by the way, a close friend of mine is going to sail the Northwest Passage precisely now because of what you bring up, that he's going to do it solo, um, up Greenland, across Canada, by Ellesmere Island. Um, is that um, you could have shipping in the northern Arctic, and this is not covered in the book, unfortunately, that could provide alternative routes that, uh, you know, that means somewhat less of an emphasis on, say, the Indian Ocean, which I wrote my last book about. Uh, it, would bring, it would bring Russia closer to America. Uh, very fundamentally through the North, it would make Canada a significant geopolitical player in world affairs to a degree that it hasn't been. Because with the Canadians, you've got shale gas, the tar sands, you've got incredible energy and hydro, uh, hydropower resources. And plus, if you have an, oak, an open Arctic, its geopolitical uh, uh, position would be that much more significant. Uh, gentleman here in the third row. Uh, Robert, uh, one, I'd like to just offer a quick comment on what you had noted before about the U.S.-Iranian relationship, that it needs to go through some level of rapprochement over the next decade. I presume you're not casting agency only on the United States, but also on Iran to some level of serious behavior change on their part. My question is really one looking into the future. You uh, talk about unburdening the U.S. Uh, responsibility for maintaining the international order. Which countries do you envision in, say, South America, in Africa? You've written about India, obviously, yeah. in the Indian Ocean. Which countries do you envision becoming major regional powers that would be allied with the U.S. and share our objectives? Um, Brazil would not be totally allied with the U.S. It's interesting that Brazil has carved out an independent identity. I remember when I was embedded for a few years with Army Special Forces, they always had trouble making arrangements to do training missions in Brazil. The Brazilians were a bit standoffish compared to everyone else in South America. Uh, Brazil, because of geography, because uh, of its close distance between Recife and West Africa, could over the, uh, over the course of the decades establish a zone of soft influence in West Africa if West Africa were to develop. Um, so Brazil would not be hostile to the United States, I don't believe, but it would certainly be prickly independent with its own point of view. And as my colleagues at Stratfor note, that may lead at some point to the U.S. to move closer to Argentina and develop Argentina's military to balance against Brazil. This is really long-range thinking. I think the best piece of strategic good luck that the United States has gotten since the end of the Cold War has been the military and economic rise of India. Um, uh, India, uh, India's had economic problems very recently. It's been overhyped in many ways. But nevertheless, if you compare India in 1991 with India in 2012, it has been an enormous development. 
Um, and it, we don't need an alliance with India. The Indians would reject it at any rate. Uh, the Indian uh, of the Indian policy establishment in New Delhi, the, the intellectual establishment would, would, um, would, would reject it as like a disease germ. What, so it can't be a transactional relationship. What we have to realize about India is simply by where it is on the map, its economic and, and, and military rise automatically hedges and balances against China. Um, so we should not try to get concessions from India or anything. We should just encourage its development in any way that we can. I saw a hand. Yes, sir. Uh, right here. Yes, please. Pavel Irgin, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. I am a geographer, and uh, your presentation, your book, is uh, are especially uh, interesting for me. But and I'd like to uh, to make one remark and ask uh, a question. My remark is on uh, Russian voting in UN and uh, other organization. Uh, it, uh, everything here is absolutely clear. When America, ya, Russia, no. When America, no. Russian, yeah. <laughs> so, and, uh, yeah. my question: uh, Would you please tell some word about, about Israel, a country which exists despite her geography? Uh, yes. Um, Good question. Russia and America have completely different geographical perspectives and different geographical situations so that their interests are different and they often clash. But we have to recognize that we don't have as, as hard an ideological disagreement with Russia today as we did during the Soviet Union. Um, yes, there is still a philosophical difference because of the way that Russia is governed and the way that we are governed. But it's not nearly as distant as it was during the Cold War. So I think that we should, um, you know, we should think of ways that we can employ Russia as a balancer. You know, in, in many parts of Eurasia. Yes, as I mentioned in the book, um, Israel exists in defiance of history in a way because of the Jewish diaspora for thousands of years without a firm territorial base that reconstituted a country. Let me say this about Israel's geography. Israel has an urban corridor that extends from Haifa to Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Um, it's a singular urban corridor. It's a small country, maybe the size of New Jersey. Um, a country like that cannot absorb even one nuclear strike. Um, even during the Cold War, there were very cynical you know, calculations like we could lose St. Louis, but the US would still go on as a country. Um, uh, and we would erect memorials to it and all of that, but it would go on. <laughs> Um, and Russia made similar calculations. Israelis can't make that calculation because whoever would not be killed would have higher cancer rates because of the small size of the country. Um, so it cannot absorb a first strike. And that geographical insecurity is at the heart of the fact that Israel has to have different red lines than we have. Um, it's a tragic thing to say, but Although our interests and Israeli interests overlap to a significant extent, they can never overlap to a total extent. And there will be areas and issues where their interests are simply different than ours. Um, and, and this may be one of them. Um, remember, Iran is a much bigger country. Iran can absorb maybe a nuclear strike. But of course, an Israeli response to a first strike would be disproportionate. Um, so that it would be, it would be um, uh, illogical, to use a very mild term, for the Iranians to actually weaponize, I think. Um, I think it may be that Iran's real power is where it is now, where it has tremendous nuclear capacity, but it doesn't have a weapon. 
and it isn't quite and it isn't quite to the point where it has the enriched uranium. Now it has real power, but once it weaponizes, it's perennially insecure 24 hours a day. Uh, what would it do with six or eight nuclear weapons? You know, low quality tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, what would that be? There would be no second strike capability. The Saudis would import Pakistani weapons, perhaps. Um, uh, Iran would be much more insecure than it is today, I think. One of the powerful themes in this book is the survival of the Jewish people culminating in, in the existence of Israel, as you say, despite uh, geography. Um, there was a, a question here. I am <clears throat> Dorn McGrath. Professor Emeritus of Geography at GW. And you are preaching, I think, to the choir. And I wonder what can be done, aside from the sales of more books. Which is a to, good thing. <laughs> which is a good thing, I agree. But also, what can be done to reawaken Americans to the realities that you have uh, so skillfully displayed for us? And uh, I would conclude on that point. Um, let me just say that geography is something that may, may not be fashionable. It has a musty aura, like a one-room schoolhouse, kind of. But I think everyone is intrinsically interested in geography. I mean, you know what books sell the most often in bookstores? Military history books. They don't get reviewed much, and they're often badly reviewed, but they sell very much, because people you know, implicitly grasp that ancient history is really military history, that the classical age is really about military history. It's the same with geography. You know, there's a natural inclination to look at a map, to always be fascinated with a map. Uh, when I was little, I loved AAA road maps, you know, the old triptychs <laughs> that they don't make anymore. So uh, there was a hand in the back. If, uh, it looks to me like Lynn Wells, but I may be mistaken. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, David. Lynn Wells from National Defense University. You're pretty optimistic uh, about the U.S. immigration laws. You talk at one point about uh, asset stripping the rest of the world of its best and brightest. How do you expect us to get there from, uh, from where we are here? I think we already are getting there. Um, uh, for instance, um, I have um, a close uh, uh, Persian friends in Oregon who told me, you know what was the ultimate res result of the Iranian revolution in 1978 to 79? All these brilliant middle class Iranians moved to the US and got business degrees and set up business and, you know, and did well. We, we essentially took the best and the brightest, not just the Shah's wealthy friends who never earned their money, uh, but the stratum below that all came to the United States. Whenever there's an upheaval in any part of the world, we get more of the best of the brightest. I, I think this has been happening. Just look how our society has changed so dramatically over, over the recent decades. The change in diets and foods and everything. We're becoming more of an international nation. That's the global duty-free hot zone for world <laughs> transactions. <laughs> What a, what a wonderful description of, <laughs> we used to think of the shining city on a hill. No, yeah. it's not. Yeah. So we have time for one last question, and I see there's a hand all the way over there. Yes, sir. Tom Pluff, John, for the Cairo Review of Global Affairs. Uh, first of all, thank you for your time. Uh, my question is if you could just give a quick comment on what the map tells us about the prospects for Arab-Israeli uh, Arab peace, excuse me, in relation to water scarcity issues in the Middle East. Yeah, uh, Turkey has all the water. That's why Turkey's going to be a great middle-level power in the 21st century. Um, uh, I, I discuss Israel for about four pages in this book, uh, about, I mean that part of Israel. And this is where I come down to sheer, unfortunately, geographic determinism. You know, this is about territory that's very precious, despite all the technological developments. And it's more precious because there's more and more people on this disputed territory, whether, whether Israeli settlers or a rising Arab birth rate. Um, so that, you know, 
it, it becomes harder and harder to achieve. I think, I'm not sure, but in the last few years, while we've been all preoccupied with Iran, Israeli settlement building has been rather robust. Um, and you know, this doesn't get much news now, but, f but facts are being created on the ground. It's gonna be harder to reach a solution. And just, you know, I spent this whole time, I haven't said any, I haven't given any policy recommendations, uh, um, so to speak. Let me give one which should be sheer common sense, uh, which is what uh, I think James Baker showed so ably back when he was Secretary of State, which is that, for there to be any Arab-Israeli peace, given the geographical imperatives, the U.S. has to be involved as an honest broker in a very proactive way. So, um, as I, I'm sure you have seen in this discussion, this is, this is a, a brilliant and provocative book, uh, and I urge people to buy it and read it. And I think Bob is, is prepared to sign some yes, books afterwards. Yes. So, um, you'll want to line up for that, but please um, join me in thanking Bob for his. Thank you. Thank you.